Okay, so welcome again. Welcome to the second lecture of this course, Cyber Physical System Fundamentals. I would like to start this uh, second lecture uh, by referring to something that uh, hopefully you learned during the first lecture. I would like to start this lecture by referring to a number of characteristics of uh, embedded and cyber physical systems. You should remember that in the very first lecture, uh, I was referring to some characteristics such as the dependability. We have to make sure that our systems are dependable as uh, required by the applications. Furthermore, these systems need to be efficient, and this efficiency has a number of different aspects. For example, we have to look at uh, energy efficiency. Furthermore, one of the characteristics was the fact that we are using the embedded system, the information processing part, in this so-called hardware in the loop, uh, where the IT components were interfaced with the physical environment, and there are a number of consequences from this direct connection to the physical environment. Also, and partially resulting from the previous uh, requirement, uh, we have the need to meet uh, real-time constraints. Now, the uh, new issue today is that all these characteristics, they are leading to corresponding challenges. That means if we are seriously taking the required dependability into account, we have to make sure that the overall system will be dependable as required. That might have an impact on the physical partitioning, for example, that might have an impact on the specification technique. So I think in general it can hardly be overemphasized how important it is to take uh, required dependability levels into account right from the beginning. The same applies to the required uh, efficiency. So, for example, if we have a port portable system, we need to make sure that we are reaching uh, the level of energy efficiency that's required to make that system useful if uh, the uh, consumers, if the users are carrying their system uh, with them, uh, they uh, want to have a battery lifetime that's sufficient for the application. And again, that might have some far-reaching consequences, such as, for example, on the choice of uh, processes and, and hardware platforms in general. Also, the fact that we have this direct uh, connection to physical hardware uh, has some impact. We have to make sure uh, that uh, the information processing part really can be interfaced to the physical environment. And meeting real-time constraints also has some far-reaching consequences. Uh, it has some impact on the hardware platforms that we can use. It has impact on the specification technique. It has an impact on the communication protocols, etc. So there are far-reaching consequences. And I think many people are underestimating the consequences that are resulting from these characteristics. So it's the widespread belief that in one way or the other, uh, techniques that are known from PC-like applications can also be used for uh, real-time systems. And in many cases, this is actually wrong. So this is something uh, that is making life a little more difficult when we're designing uh, cyber-physical and embedded systems. Um, in the early days of embedded system design, it was rather typical to consider embedded systems to uh, comprise a special purpose hardware boards. So many people uh, believed in the early days that uh, one had to design a special purpose hardware board and this special purpose hardware board was then called the, the embedded system. Now with the trend towards uh, smaller and, and smaller systems, there was a trend towards so-called systems on a chip. Uh, that means uh, people try to integrate all the electronics on one chip which led to so-called application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs. Now, ASICs initially were uh, feasible because in the early days, the uh, fabrication technology was uh, working with rather large feature sizes and uh, producing the optical mass that were required for these large feature sizes initially was not too expensive. However, in the meantime, fabrication technology has advanced towards uh, smaller and smaller feature sizes, 
and as a result of that, making these masks becomes more and more expensive. And as a result, the cost for making such a mask has gone to the mega dollar range, being a little bit de uh, technology dependent. And as a result of that, it may be too expensive to actually produce a mask for such an application. Also, if we are working with ASICs, it's a problem that these ASICs implement everything in hardware. And if there is a problem with uh, the specification, if some part of the specification is changing, uh, then we might have to start all over again and uh, we might have to design a new circuit, which would then involve the mass cost again, uh, which would be very uh, uh, uneconomical. So as a result of that, uh, there is a very clear trend, and I think that can be observed by, by many people and in many application areas. There is a clear trend towards an implementation in software because in software we have the flexibility uh, to actually uh, change the, the overall behavior to some extent. Uh, there is one option that we might uh, use in this context. Uh, this option consists of the use of so-called field programmable gate arrays. Field programmable gate arrays are in a way very generic hardware devices that can be configured uh, to behave as required. And I will talk about the FPGAs very briefly in, in this chapter three. So in most of the cases, uh, we will be trying to live with uh, software implementations, which means that we will be focusing on software implementations of embedded and cyber physical systems. Now this might lead to, to one very important question. If all these systems will be implemented in software, do we then have to learn anything? Is there actually a need for specialists in the area? Uh, do we need a special course on embedded and cyber physical system design if everything is software anyway? Maybe I can just send you to the so next course in software engineering. I would then have some free time until the end of this uh, semester and I will just send you to join the other guys who are working and, and learning software engineering. So maybe this could be the end of the course and I would have a fine time. So unfortunately, it's not like that. Uh, in contrast, uh, we have already learned uh, during uh, the first lecture uh, that um, there are many things to take into account when we design an embedded system. And therefore, it's not possible to just consider embedded system design, even if it's in software, as a special case of software engineering. In order to design uh, such a cyber physical system, knowledge from many different areas must be available. So we see uh, right now on, on this picture that we have this large amount of, of areas in, in science in general. We have computer science, we have electrical engineering, we have physics, we have statistics, we have medicine, we have mechanical engineering. Uh, there are very close links to biology in the meantime. And you know, there are all these different areas and unfortunately the links between these areas are not as strong as they should be. But for embedded system design, we should tear down the walls between these different areas uh, because much of the interest in embedded systems is actually uh, in linking these uh, things together. So therefore, I created this uh, little animation which tells us how things should be. Now I'm raising the question to you as an audience, uh, what's wrong with this little animation? What's the problem there? Do you see any problem? I'm not referring to the fact that the wall to computer science is taller than in the other cases. Um, that may be a problem itself. I'm not sure if it's significant in any way. But they don't know to use the right tool. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's pretty close to what I had in mind. From my point of view, there is no progress. Let me tell you, I put these people on the slide uh, about 10 years ago, and in these 10 years, there is no progress. <laughs> it's always the same. <laughs> okay. So hopefully, there will be more progress in the future. 
so we see that uh, uh, one of the challenges is in uh, linking the different domains. Uh, but even if we achieve linking the different domains, there, there are additional specific challenges for the, the design of software in this area. One challenge is coming from the fact that we are working with uh, dynamic environments. That means we are using our information processing devices in very different uh, contexts. And therefore, for example, we cannot work with any static IP addresses because we will be in a different network all the time, for example, when we use a mobile system. And uh, another problem is uh, the fact that uh, we have to specify the behavior in many different domains. We have to specify a functional behavior, we might have to specify an electrical behavior, a mechanical behavior, and this means that all these types of behavior, they will be specified in different languages and in different uh, specification techniques, which means it's already very difficult to capture the behavior in, in these uh, kind of heterogeneous languages. And now, if we suppose that somehow we are able to capture the behavior, uh, then the next problem arises. We have to validate these specifications. We have to make sure that these specifications are complete, that they are without any contradictions, that they are meaningful. And this is even more a problem because we have these heterogeneous languages, which makes everything pretty complicated. Now let's be optimistic and we believe that somehow we will get over that problem and somehow we manage to actually validate our specifications. Then the next problem is that we have to translate these uh, specifications into some final design. And it's not sufficient just to have some final design, but we have to have a, an efficient one. It has to be energy efficient, it has to respect the real time constraints. Again, that's not very easy. Now let's again be optimistic and we assume that in uh, some way we are able to finally design something. Then for the de final design, we have to make sure that it actually meets our real-time constraints. And it is very difficult to prove that we are meeting the real-time constraints. We have observed cases where even vendors of processes are not quite sure about the timing of their processes. So which means that it's very difficult to prove that we are meeting the real-time constraint. And now, in, in general, it's a problem to validate that our system is working correctly. We might have to work with huge amounts of data. So for example, if we have a TV set uh, showing high definition TV, then there is a huge amount of data. And typically, it's not really possible or very difficult, at least, to simulate a system with such a huge amount of data. There may be other cases where validating a system may be safety critical. Assume that you have designed a nuclear power plant where you run certain control software. We know already by experience that doing a testing on the real power plant may be safety critical. So testing in contrast to testing of some office application may be safety critical and not that easy at all. Now suppose that somehow we get across all these uh, problems, then we might have some hope because some people told us, well, software in embedded systems is smaller than software in general, uh, so maybe it's easier to, to actually see what's going on there because software is so much smaller than software on the PC. On this slide, I'm showing you that this may have been true in the past, uh, maybe some of this is still true currently, but possibly it's not true in the future. And as an example, I'm referring to software which is used in a TV set. So for the time being, let's consider software in a, in a TV set as an embedded application. Now, there are two different sources to which I'm referring there. There is one source which tells us how the size of the software used in the TV set has increased over the years. And you can see a pretty steep, de steep decrease there. There's a second source according to which uh, the amount of software used in a TV has increased by a factor of 10 every six to seven years. So that's again a kind of Moore's law. 
So you can see over there how the amount of software has increased over the years. And I have a TV set which is about two years uh, old and it contains a full Linux system. And I think the total amount of code would be much larger than these 15 megabytes. So you see that it's no longer true that software used in embedded systems is much smaller than software in other systems. So as a result, we see that there is this exponential increase in uh, software uh, complexity, which we have to take into account. And as a result, it's not surprising that already about 13 years ago, uh, one of my famous colleagues, Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli, wrote that more than 70% of the development costs for complex systems such as automotive electronics and communication systems are due to software development. So we see all these challenges and we have to address all these challenges when we design cyber physical and embedded systems. In order 